لا من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and welcome to this episode of Mizan Live um, we ended last week with uh, the the uh, topic of uh, bid'ah, and Alhamdulillah, I think we he made some very good points, Ayatullah Subhani, in that regard. I hope uh, the brothers and sisters are are able to follow what his arguments were because those were important points he made about how sometimes you will not find support for something that you practice or do, but in the in this in the uh, hadiths or in the Quran, but you'll find a ge- general uh, concept in there that supports what you're doing, and that's enough for it not to be bid'ah anymore. We had we had <coughs> two conditions for bid'ah. Main conditions were that number one, it should not that which I am doing or practicing, I should be attributing it to the religion. If I'm doing it, not attributing it to the religion, then. Uh, it's not bid'ah for sure. So if I'm just holding a birthday party because I just want to have a birthday party, then that's fine because I'm not saying this is something re- religion says to do. That's number one condition. So a person who's doing something, if, you, if that thing wants to be, if wants to qualify as bid'ah, then uh, it has to be something that I am saying religion says to do. Number one. Number two is that if I'm saying religion says to do this practice and to have this ritual or whatever, then I should. If I if I don't have any support from Islamic sources for that practice, then it will qualify as bid'ah. So I say Islam says to do this and do that. One, and two, I have no proof and support from the sources to uh, back that claim. But if I do have general or specific proof for that claim, then it's not bid'ah anymore. What was important last week that we talked about a lot was that one thing that is overlooked is the general proof for certain practices that we will have. General support that we'll have from the Qur'an and ahadith regarding certain practices. So for example, if a, uh, if a group of Muslims are going to be um, celebrating the birth of the Holy Prophet. Yes, it's true that the Quran and the Ahadith don't talk about how it is mustahab to um, to celebrate the Prophet's birthday. Yes, but what you will find is that there are Ahadith. There's there are um, there are verses that will speak of how one should glorify the Holy Prophet and honor the Holy Prophet and spread the love of the Holy Prophet. And so a person who will celebrate the birth of the Holy Prophet is doing it because it falls under those categories. Yes, and so this will um, remove it from that list of things are, that are bid'ah. Why? Because the person who is doing this, they're doing it because Islam says, hey, honor the Prophet. One way of honoring the Prophet is to you know, um, celebrate his birth. Of course, in the celebration of the birth of the Holy Prophet, one should be careful not to cross any red lines of Islam. But assuming that one, that is the case, then just because I'm doing something that I don't have a specific hadith for doesn't make it bid'ah anymore. I also gave the example of, you know, in Mecca where people want to go up the Mount of Hira, or Jabal al-Nur, excuse me, the mountain of Nur, and uh, spend some time in the cave of Hira, where the Holy Prophet was, where they say the Holy Prophet would uh, go and worship Allah before he was sent as Prophet or chosen as Prophet. Um, Chosen as Prophet is not the best way of saying it. Before he was actually made Prophet by Allah. Alright, so Muslims, Mu'mineen want to go and sit in that place, maybe pray two rak'ah salat in that place, not because Islam says, you must go or is mustahab to go in the cave that the Prophet was in and pray there. Not necessarily because of that, but they're going there because that they want to be motivated spiritually. They want to go there to honor the Prophet. They want to go in there for it to have a, a spiritual effect on them. Pray two rak'ahs where the Holy Prophet used to pray. That kind of thing. 
but what you find is that they say this is bid'ah. Why? Because it was not practiced specifically by the Holy Prophet or the Sahaba. Yes? And so it's bid'ah. No, no, no. We have more general uh, commands and prescriptions in Islam that this practice falls under. What is wrong with praying where the Prophet used to pray? There's nothing wrong with that. And no one's doing it because they say this is something Islam has specifically put its finger on. Go to the cave that the Prophet used to be in. No, of course we don't have hadith for that. But they're doing it because it's a spiritual, they, they, get, they gain some spiritual closeness to Allah. They're motivated. They go up there and reflect. And they come back, inshallah, better people. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Alright, so that was bid'ah. Um, the rest of the details we've already talked about, I don't want to go back to. I will. Uh, whoever's interested can go back and listen to our previous recordings on that. Today though, we have to move into another one of those controversial topics that are related to Shi'ism specifically, mostly I would say. And Shi'ism is known for it today, although this concept is a Qur'anic and an Islamic one that is universal, and we'll get to that as well. But what is that topic? It is the topic of taqiyyah. Taqiyyah is one of those things that is misunderstood when it comes to the Shia school of thought and is sometimes used against them and is used to uh, denounce uh, and reproach the Shi'is. While taqiyyah, if understood properly, is something that you will find in the Qur'an as well. You will find that even, the, even one's common sense dictates that taqiyyah needs to be practiced sometimes. We'll talk about that today in detail. But as I've said before, why is he covering taqiyya, Ayatollah Subhani covering taqiyya in a book that is a book of theology? Because it is a book of theology, but it is a book of doctrine and our beliefs and th one of some of the more important things that we do as Shia. So he did go through Tawheed all the way to Ma'ad and Resurrection in his book of doctrines of Shia Islam. But he also wants to cover certain topics that are uh, controversial that there might be some um, questions in that regard for people who are not Shia and that's why he's covering them here in the end of his book so bid'ah we put behind and now we have to get into taqiyya article number 124 let's talk about taqiyya first he'll give us a definition of it he'll explain give it some context Give us some verses of the Qur'an, tell us a story, and then inshallah we'll get into some details of taqiyya. It says, one of the teachings of the Qur'an is that a Muslim is permitted to conceal his belief in situations wherein, as a result of, of expressing his beliefs, his life, honor, or property would be endangered. So that's the definition of taqiyya. In religious terminology, such an act is referred to as taqiyya, now, the equivalent that they use for it is dissimulation. Whatever. It is not only on religious grounds that taqiyya is justified, but intelligence and human wisdom likewise reveal the necessity and propriety of the practice in certain sensitive situations. Let me explain this. He says, look, true that we have verses of the Qur'an and we also have hadith for this uh, concept. Yeah? Taqiyya. But this is something he claims, and I agree with him, uh, very humbly agree with him, that we don't need Qur'an or Hadith for. This is something that even common sense understands. And if Allah says it in the Qur'an or there are a Hadith for it, it is just to support that which we would have understood on our own anyway. What does he mean by that? Let me explain this a little bit. Islam has uh, certain principles that are always going to override other rules of Islam. Yeah, one of them is daf al afsad bil fasid. Um, one of them is to is the, to get rid of the lesser, lesser the the bigger greater evil via the lesser evil. Let's say taqiyya means you conceal your faith, right? Faith is something very important. Lying about your faith is something bad. Yes. Concealing your faith can sometimes be bad, but what if there is something very much more important than that at stake? So for example, if someone's life is in danger, what is, this, what is the principle of 
lesser evil versus greater evil dictate here. I can either preserve my life or I can preserve, uh, or I, 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 I can either, excuse me, lose my life but not lie, for example. Although taqiyya does not mean lying. Uh, but let's just say you have no choice but to lie about your faith even. I want to take it to an extreme here. I need to, if I need to, if I want to protect my life, I need to lie about my faith. So I can either preserve my faith plus lie, or lose, excuse me, preserve my life plus lie, or lose my life and not lie. The principle of the greater good versus the lesser good, or greater evil versus lesser evil, what does it dictate here? Which one is more important? One's life or a, or a, an insignificant lie. I call it insignificant because versus one's life, one lie is insignificant. Which one is it? Or let's say you're stuck in the desert, you're about to die out of hunger, there's some haram food that you have. What does Islam say here? What does common sense say here? Which one's more important? Me having a meal that's haram? Yes, which one's worse? Me having a meal that's haram or me dying and losing my life altogether? Well, in normal circumstances, because we'll get to special circumstances, in normal circumstances where I'm dying and I have no choice but to eat haram food, of course eating haram food has, is less significant than losing my life. And so here Islam will say it is wajib for you. For you to do what? <clears throat> to have that haram meal. Okay? Taqiyya, same thing. Islam will dictate that if, one, if you concealing your faith is going to equal you preserving your life, it's wajib for you to preserve your life. No doubt. Then this is something that your mind can understand on its own. Less important, more important. Which one do I choose? Yeah, it's not your fault that now you're in a situation where you have to choose between the two. But if I am in that situation, the mind dictates. It's intellect. It's pure common sense and ration that I'm going to pick the, the lesser evil, I'm going to pick the greater good. Yes, and Islam's rules will follow that. So when Ayatollah Subhani here, he says, it is not only on reli religious grounds, that means it's not just that we have hadith or verses of Qur'an for this, but what? That, this, that taqiyya is justified, but intelligence and human wisdom, common sense I want to call it, likewise reveal the necessity and propriety of the practice in certain sensitive situations. On the one hand, the preservation of life, property, and honor are necessary, and on the other, acting according to one's beliefs is a part of one's religious duty. Okay? Which one do we choose if we have to choose between, between the two? But in those cases where the outward expression of one's belief might endanger one's life, property, or honor, and the two, du and the two duties thereby clash, Human intelligence naturally will give precedence to the most important of the two duties. I have two responsibilities. Which one am I going to choose? I either have to practice my faith properly, or I have to preserve my life. Of course, preserving life will take precedence. In truth, in, truth, in reality, taqiyya is a weapon in the hands of the weak in the face of merciless tyrants. It is obvious that in the absence of any danger, a person will not need to hide his beliefs, nor act in opposition to his or her beliefs. So this taqiyya isn't something that's going to be used all the time, but in certain situations can and must be used, he says. Okay, let's get into some uh, proof for this. Well, he says, The Qur'an refers implicitly to Ammar bin Yasir, and all those who, while at war with the disbelievers and despite the strength of their heartfelt faith, formally utter words of disbelief, of disbelief in order to save themselves. In the following verse. So it says the Qur'an in the story of Ammar bin Yasir. What is the story? Ammar bin Yasir, those of you who have seen that old uh, movie of The Message or The Messenger, I think it was The Message. It's an old movie of the Holy Prophet, a person by the name of, I think, Mustafa Aqad. Uh, he made that movie. Anyway, I don't know if it was Mustafa, I remember the Aqad part. Anyway, he in this movie it shows the torture and torment of those first Muslims at the hands of the mushrikeen 
and those elites and nobles of the mushrikeen of Quraysh, like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and the likes of them, how they would torture and torment the believers and those followers of the Holy Prophet. <sighs> and so the torture reaches a point where it's just not, it's just not, um, it's not tolerable anymore. And I'll give you an example. Like for example, one of these companions of the Holy Prophet, one of those initial ones, one of those first companions of the Holy Prophet, what they would do to him was they would put him in armor, put him under the hot sun in the heat, and, on, and they would put him on fire. So think about it. The sun is enough to burn you, yet they would put him in that armor and put him on fire under the hot sun. This is what some of these uh, companions would go through. Ammar bin Yasir, this companion of the Holy Prophet, and companion of Imam Ali salam, who was killed in the battle of Safin, um, on the, he was on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib um, in the battle of Safin, and he was killed fighting Bani Umayyah and fighting uh, against uh, Muawiyah. This Ammar, his parents were also killed as a result of the torture and torment they were undergoing as believers and followers of the Holy Prophet. When the time comes for Ammar bin Yasir to also give up his faith or die, he utters words of disbelief against God. Yeah, And so afterwards, well, of course they let him go because he says, I'm a disbeliever. And of course he was doing taqiyah when he was saying that. And so he's concealing his faith and he is, you know, lying about his faith when he says he disbelieves. That's a lie. He believed. Yet, to save his life, he did that. So now, he, after this episode, he's upset. He feels guilty. And uh, they say that he, was, he went to the Prophet crying that, you know, I made this mistake and so on. And this verse was re revealed. Surah Nahal, verse 106, مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ That yes, there are some who will disbelieve. Whoso disbelieveth in God after his belief, and then an exception is made. Except him who is forced to pretend to disbelieve, and whose heart is secure in faith. Like in other words, Ammar bin Yasir, don't worry. You are off the hook because you were forced to utter those words but your heart was still filled with Iman. Yeah. Now, this is very interesting how important this taqiyah is. We're not talking later on, we're talking advent of Islam here, where things are very sensitive, where every follower, every single follower of the Holy Prophet matters. To have four followers versus three makes a big difference, right? If taqiyah is not going to be allowed, this should be one of those places. You need to hang in there, Ammar bin Yasir. You need to fight back because these are, these are very sensitive times. Yet even in this situation, taqiyah is allowed. No, 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 no. Preserve your life. Don't lose your life over this. Okay? This is very interesting because sometimes uh, some, some will say that, yeah, taqiyah is not allowed in certain situations. And that is true. But those situations must be very dire ones that taqiyah is not allowed in. And we'll get to that as we go on. They must be very dire ones because even in this case where Ammar bin Yasir is practicing taqiyah, I personally, if you ask me, I, I would say that taqiyah might not have been allowed because this is the first, this is the advent of Islam. The Prophet needs as many supporters as he can and not show any weakness in the face of the enemies of God. Yet, here is Ammar bin Yasir showing, quote-unquote, some weakness. Quote-unquote, of course. Anyway, that's one verse. Another verse Ayatollah Subhani here has. It says, Let not the believers take unbelievers as their friends, in preference to believers. During the Holy Prophet's time, some people were taking the disbelievers as friends over the believers. لا يتخذ المؤمنون Whoever does that has no connection with Allah, is disconnected from Allah. 
But then there's an exception. Illa an tattaku minhum tuqah. Unless you're doing taqiyah. Unless it be that ye are but guarding yourselves against them. وَيُحَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسَهُ وَإِلَّا اللَّهِ الْمَصِيرُ Alright, so God is saying here in the Qur'an that during the Prophet's time, there, those people who were taking disbelievers as friends over the believers, there was a problem with that. We, we don't have time, we don't want to get into uh, the tafsir of this verse and the whole story behind it. Yeah, but there was a time where this was not allowed. I mean, some people might use this verse and say, even today, anyone who's non-Muslim, we're not allowed to be their friend. No, no, that's not what it's saying. Um, uh, at least uh, in, from my understanding this is not saying that here in this day and age you can't have any non-Muslim friends only your friends only have to be Muslim no this was a certain time certain circumstances were there and the mu'mineen were taking the disbelievers as friends over other believers and that wasn't the time for that um, of course I'm not going to encourage having uh, disbeliever friends as well especially the ones who might inf- influence us in a bad way, then it might even be haram to befriend them. Right? So let's make that clear. But just because you have a non-Muslim friend doesn't mean you're committing haram. If that person isn't going to be affecting you and they're respecting your faith and allowing you to practice your faith the way you need to. So this, uh, this verse is talking about during the Prophet's time, there was this certain circumstances, you weren't supposed to take them as your friends over other believers. Yet some people are going to do that. The Quran says they're in trouble. But there is an exception. There, there might be times where you are going to befriend the, non, the, the disbelievers as a result of taqiyah, as a result of you doing so, so that you can preserve your lives, not get in trouble with your, and lose your property, your honor, your wealth, these things. Yeah, so that's another verse that Ayatollah Subhani here, he, 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 he cites for us. To prove his point that, yeah, this is something that's rooted in our uh, sources as well. The idea of taqiyah, to preserve our lives. He says, in the light of these two verses, the Muslim commentators, not Shia, Muslims, all Muslims, commentators unanimously attest to the religious sanction given to taqiyah. So we have to understand that this is something that is sanctioned, it's allowed now, where else we can practice it is a different story. But no one can come out and say, oh, taqiyah, the Shia, for example, they practice taqiyah, so there's something wrong with them. No, they are practicing a Qur'anic principle. Indeed, anyone who has conducted um, a little bit of research into Qur'anic commentary and Islamic jurisprudence will know that the principle of taqiyah is justified within Islam. The verses above and the actions of, for example, the believing folk of Fir'aun who hid their faith while outwardly denying it cannot be overlooked. Right. So we have another story here that he refers to. There was one person, not the believers, but there was one believer, I think Surah, uh, he says here Surah Ghafir 28 talks about that story. Yeah. So during Fir'aun's time, Prophet Musa's time, there was a believer who was doing taqiyah as well, he says. These all show, and the verses that we covered, show that this is something that's widely accepted and cannot be overlooked in Islam. But taqiyya has, for the most part, been opposed. However, it must be said that despite... Yes, excuse me, the way it was written here, I don't, I don't like it. Forget about that line that says, but taqiyya has, for the most part, been opposed. Let's leave that aside. However, we want to talk, he wants to talk about one thing here. He says, however, please do keep in mind, some people might say, taqiyah that is in the Qur'an and has been sanctioned in the Qur'an is the taqiyah that you exercise right, in the face of, non, of the disbelievers who are going to take your life. And in other words, the, a person might want to argue here and say, Taqiyya is not allowed when it comes to other Muslims. So if a Muslim, a Muslim can't do taqiyya with another Muslim, they should only do it to the disbelievers. Why? Because that's what the Quran was talking about. In all those cases, it was Muslim versus non-Muslim. Excuse me, believer versus disbeliever. Not believer and believer. But now we see that the Muslims, the Shia, for example, do and practice taqiyya even when it comes to other Muslims. Why is that the case? 
Well, his answer is very clear, Ayatollah Subhani. Once again, it goes back to common sense. If I am from a certain, for example, denomination of Islam, and someone else is from another denomination of Islam, and that person believes me to be a non-Muslim and wants to take my life, for example, as a result of my beliefs and my faith, then of course, preserving life was the standard, right? If preserving life was the standard, then that standard applies here as well. That my life is in danger by another Muslim, not a disbeliever, a non-Muslim, by a Muslim just like myself. So I need to still preserve my life. Either I expose my faith and lose my life by, an, by, a, by another Muslim, or I don't expose it and I preserve my life. Which one do I do? Well, once again, the same common sense that told us that you need to preserve your life if it's a non-Muslim who might take your life, will tell us that if it's a Muslim that might take your life, you should also practice taqiyya. This is the point that he wants to make here. He says, however, it must be said and noted that despite the fact that the verses regarding taqiyya were revealed in respect of the possibility of, dis- of taqiyya in the face of disbelievers, the principle established is not restricted in its applicability to those circumstances wherein the life, property, and honor of Muslims are threatened only by disbelievers. You can't restrict it to that. For if the expression of one's beliefs or action according to one's beliefs gives rise to fear for one's life, property, and honor which are being threatened by another Muslim, then taqiyya in such a situation will be upheld by the same principle that allows it to be upheld before disbelievers. This is very, uh, very. Uh, it'll be very uh, non-smart, let's say, and unsmart to say that taqiyya only applies when your life is in danger by non-Muslims. But if your life is in danger by other Muslims, taqiyya is not allowed because the verses are only talking about non-Muslims. No, that's not the case at all. The standard is preserving life. That applies in these cases as well. So now here, Ayatul Subhani quotes Abu Huraira. Of course, in the Shi'i school of thought, Abu Huraira's ahadith uh, will not hold the, uh, the reliability and authenticity that they hold in the Sunni school of thought. But Ayatul Subhani is bringing this here because throughout history, usually, it has been people who um, were from the non Shi'i school of thought who might have persecuted Shia. Like, for example, during the time of Bani Abbas. Bani Abbas weren't um, Shia in the sense that we have today. And so, or Bani Umayyah, for example, they of course weren't Shia like we, in the sense that we have today. And so they believe in the authenticity of the hadiths of Abu, the likes of Abu Huraira. And so Ayatullah Subhani says, here, I'll give you a hadith by him. I will use proof from your own sources to show you that this is also allowed. So he says that Abu Huraira said, I have received from the Prophet two types of knowledge and instruction. One of them I have transmitted to people, but the other I have kept to myself, for had I conveyed it to you, I would have been killed. So Abu Huraira understands this, that there's just some things, there are just some things you're not supposed to share, because if you do, your life might be in danger. So with this, Ayatollah Subhani wants to say that, look, don't think that uh, we have a problem, we're the only ones who do this. No. Others from the other schools of thought also believe in this, and they practice it. The historical, rec- rec- re- the historical record of the Umayyad and Abbasid Khalifas is full of injustice and oppression. In those days, it was not only the Shia who, as a result of manifesting their beliefs, were rejected and banished and were thus forced to resort to uh, taqiyya. Sunni scholars of hadith were also compelled during the rule of Ma'mun, for example, to take the path of taqiyya over the question of the createdness of the Qur'an. So they were usually uh, practicing taqiyya as well. We talked about this before in this same... um, in these same sessions in the past, way in the past, we were talking about the Qur'an and the createdness of the Qur'an and how during the time of Ma'mun, Ma'mun pushed for the the idea of the createdness of the Qur'an and how Sunni scholars were against this notion. 
And so here, Ayatollah Subhani is saying that they had to practice taqiyya or else they would have been tortured and killed maybe. But he does make one exception. He says there was one person who did not practice taqiyya and that was the famous Ahmad bin Hanbal, uh, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, who outwardly accepted the edict of Ma'mun on this, uh, excuse me, it says all of them except one outwardly accepted the edict of Ma'mun on this question. So Ahmad bin Hanbal was the only exception. He didn't accept it. He didn't practice taqiyya. And we all have heard the stories of him, how he was uh, jailed as a result or maybe even tortured as a result of not giving in to this notion. As a result of him not practicing taqiyya. Point being that this has been something recurring throughout history. That even Muslims had their own little inquisition every now and then. Just like the, the Catholic Church had the Inquisition, um, especially in places like Spain and other places where people were inquired of their beliefs and as a result of not having the beliefs that the Church wanted them, they were in trouble, sometimes even maybe uh, burned at the stake, imprisoned and tortured and so on. That same way, unfortunately, in Islam, we've had cases of that as well. Not, of course, as bad as that, but it's reached a point where sometimes people were uh, persecuted as a result of their beliefs, although they were Muslim, by other Muslims. Question is, in these situations, in these cases, am I supposed to just express what I believe in and just lose my life, or vice versa? Here he's saying that no, even in the Sunni school, because lots of times um, certain scholars, I don't want to say this is mainstream Sunni, but there are certain scholars from the Sunni school who will call the Shia out on this uh, to the Subhani is trying to prove that look this is why the Shia have to practice taqiyya and as a matter of fact even Sunni scholars in the past used to practice it because they want to protect their lives that is article 124 moving on to article 145 125 excuse me Having said all of that and having established the principle, the main rule here regarding preserving your life, preserving your wealth, preserving your honor and dignity, having said all of that, or preserving the life of your fellow mu'mineen and muslimin also. Sometimes you're not going to be in danger, but saying something or doing something is going to cause others somewhere else to lose their lives or get in trouble. Even there, taqiyya is wajib. It has to be practiced. But having said all of this, in the next article, Ayatul Subhani explains the ex uh, exception to this rule. There is an exception. Sometimes, even if a person's life is endangered, taqiyya is not going to be allowed. So we want to talk about that a little bit. He says, from the point of view of Shi'ism, taqiyya, one second, from the point of view of Shi'ism, taqiyya is necessary in certain conditions, but forbidden in others. Oh, okay. So we have to learn what those exceptions are, where those cases are going to be. In the latter case, one cannot resort to taqiyya anymore on the pretext that's, that one's life or property might be endangered. Okay. Oh, we, are, we just got a question. Uh, sisters asking, Salam, what if the right to use taqiyya is not availed? Can you explain with an example maybe or explain what you exactly mean and then we'll, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> All right, so it says here, he says, sometimes there will be cases where taqiyya is forbidden. And so if it's forbidden, that means even if your life is on the line, you still cannot practice taqiyya, okay? But when is that? We have to understand. It says certain groups believe that the Shia uphold the necessity of taqiyya in an unconditional manner. Such a belief is completely erroneous. And the leading authorities of Shi'ism, the ulama, the scholars, have never entertained it. 
Such leaders have always taken note of the conditions of their time, paying careful attention both to the requirements of the general welfare of the Muslims and to the avoidance of whatever is to the detriment thereof, and have thus chosen appropriate paths for that. Therefore, we see that in fact there have been times when the Shia have not taken up the path of taqiyyah, but have on the contrary sacrificed their lives and their property in the cause of bearing witness to their beliefs. Right? <clears throat> So, sister is continuing her question, following up. She says, what, I, what she means is, in the case of life and death or protecting others, what if the right to use taqiyya is not availed? I, I want to see what this uh, right to use it is not availed means. Like, do you mean that if I do taqiyya, it's not going it's, it's to be of any avail, of any benefit? Is that what you're asking? Or uh, what do you mean exactly? Are you saying, is your question... Um, what if taqiyya is not going to benefit if we lose our life or not over it? Is that your question? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just not getting it. My my mind is not working proper, properly right now. <laughs> if you can explain a little bit more what you mean. What you mean if the right to use it is not availed, is not allowed or is not beneficial? What do you mean exactly? Alright, so continuing until we get uh, a little bit more of an explanation of what the question is. What is he trying to say here? He's saying that, look, in some cases, right, there will be a wajib or a haram taqiyya. And Shia scholars are able to identify those. Yes, it goes against the rule. Yes, it goes against the default, right? Um, but it has to happen. And taqiyya is not going to be allowed. And if a person does taqiyya, they are in big trouble. For example, the Quran talks about how those people who turn their backs when they're fighting alongside the Holy Prophet and Islam is in danger and then all of a sudden they run away. Well, why are they running away? Uh, they're running away to protect their lives. But this is not a place that you're supposed to protect your life. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me see if I can remember some of the key words of that verse. Uh, um, let me see if I can... Yeah. Surah Anfal, verse 16. Whoever turns his back to flee from the enemies of the Prophet, fighting against the Prophet, from them that day, okay, his refuge shall be hell, an evil destination. The person's running away from the battlefield. The Prophet needs your help. And you're running away from the battlefield. <laughs> well, you saved your life, but... Your refuge shall be hell, an evil destination. Okay? The only time you're allowed to do that, he says, the Quran says here, is if that's a strategy. If you're fleeing so you can uh, rejoin or reunite with others so you have more power, then you can attack again. So during the Prophet's time, there were some people who would flee from the battlefield. The Prophet needs you. <laughs> you're not supposed to flee on the battlefield when you're with the Holy Prophet. Yet they would do that. And so it would happen sometimes. The Qur'an says, look, you saved your life, but you're in trouble. This is not a place to save your life. This is a place to put your life on the line, as a matter of fact. Okay, so now, these cases, cases like these will be haram. Okay, so now, um, okay, so, sister is saying, that yeah, that's what she meant by the question, yeah. So if a person is going to do taqiyyah, and doing taqiyya is not going to be of any benefit, and they're going to lose their life anyway, then of course, then it doesn't make a difference if you do taqiyya or not. Um, if, for example, they're going to say, we're going to, sh we're going to kill you anyway. We don't care what you say. Okay, it would seem to be a better thing now if a person is going to lose their life anyway to uh, you know, speak the truth, at least try to get the truth out as much as they can. Taqiyya is only applicable when there's a chance even if it's a slight chance, but there's a chance that you're going to save your life or other people's lives. Yeah. Or there's a chance if you do that, it's a wiser decision to make because it will have less of a negative effect on others or yourself. But if you're 100, 110% sure that, okay, I'm going to lose my life anyway, yeah, then uh, of course, taqiyya, taqiyya doesn't apply there anymore, sister. What about during the times of today 
when Shiism and others are under attack, should we take to Facebook and profess the truth at risk of rejection from the general populace? Rejection is not going to necessarily be uh, a reason to now do taqiyya. Okay, people are not going to uh, uh, accept what you're saying. That's Rejection is fine. Taqiyya is for more uh, dire situations, brother, um, where it's going to hurt you, your family, it's going to hurt your wealth, it's going to hurt your life, or those around you, or Muslims here or there across the world even. Yeah? Um, but, but look, this we're talking about the theory right now. There are going to be a lot of questions that come up that, oh, what about this situation? What about that situation? What about me posting a picture online? If it means me posting the picture might get me in trouble. These are all different scenarios that uh, we have to see what our, our, our scholars say in that regard. I don't want to get into that right now because that will be a, a continuous uh, discussion. And as you all know, even today, um, there's a lot of dis di differences of opinion on how outspoken uh, we should be regarding certain matters. Uh, some will have uh, a, one approach, others will have another approach. Um, both Every person, is with, it's their discretion and we cannot call each other out, I'm going to say, and say, oh, this person is doing it differently, so they must be wrong, they must have weak faith, they must be cowards. No, 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 no. Every person has their own discretion, every person needs to make the wisest decision they feel. Weigh it out and see, what am I going to gain? What am I going to lose if I say this or do that? Yeah? If it's worth it, then it's worth it, I'll make that decision. If, it's, if I believe that it is not worth it, and I need to focus my energy elsewhere, then that's the wiser decision for me, I make that decision. What is very concerning is the fact that if a mu'min decides and identifies a situation to be a situation that taqiyya should be practiced in, what is very concerning and disappointing is that another mu'min will call that person out, whether on social media or anywhere else. That is a little worrying. No, 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 that's not what Ahlul Bayt have taught us to Make, we have enough enemies out there and then make others that are also believers our enemy because they don't do things the way we do it. Because this person chose to do taqiyah and that one didn't choose to do taqiyah. This is something that is, I think, very, very important. And our grand scholars are always trying to fight this idea of, you know, calling each other out in that way. Anyway, um, theoretically speaking though, yes, there will be situations where we're not allowed to do taqiyah. It says here, in fact, the ma'sum imams of Shi'ism have for the most part been martyred, having met their death either through the sword or through the poison of their enemies. So it shows that they weren't quiet all the time either. When they needed to speak out, they would speak out. Without doubt, if they had presented a smiling face and offered up sweet words to the rulers of their, to the rulers of their times, they would, have been, um, they would have been taken care of with the highest positions of power and privilege. But these imams knew all too well that taqiyya, for example in the face of a Yazid, is not allowed, would have given rise to the disappearance of true religion and the effacement of the correct application of the faith. In contemporary conditions also, there are two types of religious obligation incumbent upon the religious leaders of the Muslims. In certain circumstances to resort to taqiyya and in others, wherein the fundamentals of the faith are endangered. It's going to lead to people leaving the faith, forgetting the faith, to, pre to be prepared to give up one's life and face death even. right? So he says, even today that we have both sides of the, of the coin. Today, if I see that Islam is going to be destroyed, all of Islam, the fundamentals of Islam are going to be undermined, then I have to speak out no matter what. Once again, as I said before, this is something that really depends on uh, the times, the circumstances, and of course the guidance of our scholars. Uh, one person will see something as you know, leading to the destruction of Islam altogether. Another will say, no, slow down there, buddy. Like, not every single thing that happens against Islam it equals the total effacement of Islam. And us losing people as a result of it is not worth it. It's not the wisest thing to do. So as I said, again, there will be differences of opinion here. And each person will identify the, the situation 
according to their understanding. What is important is if I have identified that I have to do one thing versus another, I'm careful not to go out there and call my fellow brother or sister out and say, oh, this person is, uh, look, at how, look at this coward. Or look at this person who is so dumb that they're putting themselves out there no matter what, in the line of fire, for example. Both sides have to keep the respect of the other side as well. All right. In conclusion, he says, let us all recall that this that uh, taqiyya is a personal affair and that it pertains to individuals placed in a position of weakness in the face of powerful enemies. Th- they dissimulate insofar as they consider that if dissimulation is not made, not only do they lose their lives, but also no positive advantage is derived from their being killed or losing their property and so on and so forth. This is it right here, brothers and sisters. This is it right here, Ayatollah Subhani, what he says. In one line, it was a long line though, Brothers and sisters who might call each other out sometimes, who might disagree with one another, one another over their discretion, he says, all in all, in conclusion, let us remember that taqiyya is a personal affair and that it pertains to individuals placed in a position of weakness in the face of powerful enemies. All right. So this idea of, because I heard recently someone said this, Taqiyya should only be used, you know, in a certain case where um, well, they, they refer to it in a certain way, I don't want to say it, where I felt like that really limits the scope of taqiyya to like almost never. Here it's saying, look, you're weaker and they're stronger and you fear for losing some, something very significant like your life, like other things that we talked about before. That is... Enough to sanction taqiyya. Yeah. That's what he's saying here in, in, in this part. It's interesting how he says it's a personal affair. Let me look at the Farsi very quickly and see if he says that. Yeah, he says, Dar payan yadavar mi shavim ke taqiyya yek amr shakhsi. It is shakhs, it's shakhsi, it's amr shakhsi. It is a personal matter. And the discretion is on each individual separately. So this is very important. It's interesting how he makes this point in the end. All right, anyway. But there is no place for taqiyya in regard to the teaching and clarification of the doctrines and rulings of religion. So here he makes one more point, and I'll end after this point. He says, look, the scholars though, they're not allowed to, when they're writing books on Islam, to practice taqiyya in their books. Either don't write the book, or if you're going to write it, write it the way it's supposed to be. Okay, If you're going to write a book on, on Shi'ism, for example, and the beliefs of Shi'ism, you can't write in that book that yes, the Shia believe that Imam Ali is the fourth Imam, the fourth Khalifa after the first three. No, 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 no. You can't write that in your book because this is something that will be passed on and on for future generations. And people will think that that's actually what, something we're supposed to believe in. Don't write a book at all then. He says, therefore no book has, oh, excuse me, he says, there's no place for taqiyya in regard to the teaching and clarification of the doctrines and rulings of religion. For example, no scholar can write a book on the basis of taqiyya in which deviant doctrines are presented in the, in the guise of Shi'i belief, in the uh, clothing of Shi'i belief, and disseminated as such to the public. Therefore, no book has been written in the field of beliefs and rulings on the basis of taqiyya throughout the course of the history of Shi'ism. On the contrary, even in the most difficult times, Shi'i scholars have always made manifest the true beliefs of this perspective. Of course, there are differences of opinion as regards certain principles and issues, but never has there been any Shi'i scholar who has written a book or treatise contradicting any clear and important aspect of Shi'i belief. Nor have any such scholars expressed one thing in public and something contrary in secret. Anyone who employs such methods of discourse puts himself outside the fold of Shi- Imami Shi'ism. Which, I mean, when he says this, uh, that's something that Ayatollah Subhani is saying. Uh, not necessarily will this, uh, you know, this is not something that's set in stone. But if someone does do this kind of taqiyya, then they're outside of Shi'ism, writes a book out of taqiyya. Not necessarily. But, um, I mean, I will very humbly have to uh, um, disagree with the, gener- general, gen- the general uh, no- uh, nature of this statement that he makes here. But, 
all in all, he's making a very good point that look, when you write a book out of taqiyya, then you're gonna, this is gonna go on forever and people will not, may not be able to identify that what you're saying is out of taqiyya and they'll believe in certain beliefs that, you're, that are not part of imamiyya shia. And in, in the end he says, look, anyone who finds it hard for themselves to, be, to and, and hard to digest that taqiyya is something to be practiced, the shia, why are they practicing taqiyya so much? Even till today, they practice taqiyya so much. He says, all you need to do is go and read into the history of the Shia till today. From the time of the Imams till today, how much persecution they've suffered, how much trouble they've been through as a result of just their a few things that they don't believe in that the majority of the Muslims believe in. He says that. And he says, if you're very upset about taqiyya, then you should be upset at those who put the Shia in a position where they have to practice taqiyya. Yeah, It's not their fault that they have to. You think they don't like expressing their faith? You don't think they like speaking about their faith? I mean, come on. Here we are right now uh, recording a session uh, on Shi'i Imamiyya doctrine in a place where we know that, okay, we're not going to be persecuted for our beliefs. So yeah, we like to express our beliefs. We like to talk about it. We like to sit at a table of dialogue and discuss matters of contention amongst other schools of thought. Yes, with them. It's some, that's something that we, we have no problem with at all and we like. But if we are put in that position that we have to do taqiyya, then those who put us in that position, they're the ones to be scolded, not the ones who are trying to preserve their life, their wealth and property, their honor and dignity, their families, their loved ones, and so on and so forth. But we find this in other parts of the world, unfortunately. So they're the ones who are at fault, the ones who put them in that position not the ones who are actually practicing taqiyya. Taqiyya, of course, goes against the grain. Taqiyya, of course, is not something that we would like to do. It's not something that Allah would want us to do. We want to speak the truth the way we want to. But, in certain situations, we have no choice. So he says, look into history. If you look into history, you'll find out, you'll understand why the Shia do what they do. Um, but, of course, it is sometimes blown out of proportion. And sometimes, they make us look like they make the Shia look like we are always lying about our faiths or something like that. No, brothers and sisters, that's not the case. A person who's impartial will find that that's not the case at all as well. All right. We went through taqiyya. What the rule is with taqiyya. What the exception to that rule is. And how sometimes you have to put your life on the line for that purpose and so on and so forth. And the very important point of how taqiyya is a matter that uh, is to the discretion of every person on their own. And we can't call each other out if I have a different discretion. Yes, I can try to uh, convince the other person that, look, this is not a place for taqiyya, for example. But if they're not convinced, I can't call them out on it. This was something very important that Ayatollah Subhani, a point that he made here. We don't need more division and more animosity amongst ourselves. Inshallah, that's something that we keep in mind. All right, so we are done with taqiyya, inshallah. Coming next session, next week we don't have a uh, class, just rem reminding you. The flyer... Um, you know, has said that our last session was will be the 21st of January. So be on the lookout for the February schedule when it comes out. Uh, you know where to find that on the website or on the Facebook page, etc. Um, but the next topic we'll have to talk about is another controversial one. And that is the topic of Tawassul. And this is one of the most important, most controversial uh, topics that the Shia need to explain and are sometimes are usually called out for tawassul and uh, what, what, whatever he has to say about that. So inshallah till then, um, till two weeks from now most probably, uh, inshallah, or maybe later, I don't know, we'll have to see uh, when the next uh, flyer, <laughs> we'll have to see when the next session is. Uh, just look out for the flyer inshallah. Uh, for, for the, till, uh, until that session where we cover tawassul, inshallah keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.